Hi, everyone. Welcome back. You're still with us here on the C Morning Show. And we're going to talk a little bit of sports today and something near and dear to my heart. Uh, basketball in particular. Now, various categories of sports have developed in time, over time here in Indonesia, one of which is basketball and especially in recent years. Not only that, both the men's and women's squads of the Indonesian national basketball team had secured their first gold medals in back-to-back C -back games. And in addition, the Indonesian Basketball League, or IBA, or IBL itself has developed rapidly. Let's talk more about the Indonesian basketball scene as we have with us an Indonesian basketball legend. He had a long and illustrious uh, pro career as well as some uh, uh, career in broadcasting with me as well. We did some road tours together. A very good friend of mine who is now back in Indonesia, Uncle Ro, aka Mario Wusang, joining us here this morning. How's Hello. it going, brother? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Long time no see. Obviously, the time. pandemic did not help. Uh, um, so you had a, a, a very, as I mentioned, a very long and established career as a pro here in Indonesia. You represented Indonesia on a national stage, an international stage as well. Um, and you made the shift. I mean, we did some, we did, uh, some uh, games at the ASEAN Basketball League together. But in 2018, you decided to move back to the United States and you became a development coach. Now, there were, I'm sure there were many offers and options for you to take. You could have gone the coaching route. You could have stayed here in Indonesia where you're very well respected and could have done something here. Why make the move back to the States at that time? Well, you know, I mean, I grew up in the States, so, you know, the States is always going to be my home. Um, my heart will always be with Indonesia, of course, um, especially with the basketball things that I've done here. But, you know, I wanted to, I, honestly, I needed a couple years to uh, get away from the game. Okay. Um, and it wasn't my intention to get back into basketball, but I started a skill, develop, a skill development coach at 360, which is a company out there. Right. And then after about eight months, I said, you know what, well, let me try my own. So I started Row Basketball Academy. So it's been over just over a year right now. Okay. So yeah. was this, was it uh, difficult at first when you retired? And then is that, because a lot of people say that. Like, I mean, you heard but the greats, like the late Kobe Bryant even, it was difficult for him to step the away from the game that he actually had to kind of leave it for a while before he decided what he was going to do going forward. Is that what it was like? I think so, man. I think it's 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 our identity of when we've been playing for so long. Okay. I've been playing since a young age. So you kind of lose that identity and you kind of want to figure out what is the next challenge, mm -hmm. what you've been on a routine, this basketball routine for so many years. So yeah, I definitely needed a reboot, recharge, refresh my mind. So yeah, it took about a year and a half off away from the game. I couldn't even watch it. All right. So, uh, wow, that's tough. I can yeah. imagine, though, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit. Before we get into your uh, basketball academy itself, you were one of the players that I heard of in the early 2000s, and I failed to mention this as well, that you had a very decent college career in the United States as well. Um, at that time, what year was that? That was 98. 98. I graduated high school in 97 and uh, entered college right okay. after that, so 98. There weren't a lot of Asians playing basketball at that level yeah. at that time. What was it like for you? Well, it was, it was hard, you know, I, I grew up in an environment where there were not many Asians at all. Uh, Indonesians, of course, they didn't even know what, where that was at the time. Um, it was challenging, but I, I always looked at it like I was just one of them, you know. I never looked at it like I'm the Asian kid, I'm Indonesian. I never looked at basketball like that. Um, I was always competitive and, you know, uh, I was fortunate to be able to get a scholarship to go to college. That's right. The results speak for themselves. And now you are trying to help others develop their skills so they can play at that same level, if not higher. Tell us about this basketball academy, Row Basketball Academy. So I started Row Basketball Academy just over a year ago. And then, you know, just coming back into the coaching and teaching part of basketball is the closest thing to playing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a different type of fulfillment, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, so fulfilling, man. When I see a kid at 13 years old develop and get better as the months go by, a year goes by, it's just like, um, you know, I'm, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is my purpose, you know. So that's why I started Row Basketball Academy. I, I think I can equate it with like before you get married and you're living, you're living it up just for you, and then yep. when you have kids and you settle down to have a family, exactly. and there's a different satisfaction, right? It's different oh, things exactly, you're trying to achieve. Exactly. So I just, you know, it's given me a chance to get back into the game, and obviously basketball is a always been a huge part of my life and so I'm back in the uh, basketball world now. Okay so let's talk a little bit about some of these kids that are in your academy. Yeah. What is it that you're trying to develop in them at that age? Oh man you know you're teaching them 
just like me. I learned everything I learned in basketball from discipline, hard work, teamwork. You know, I take to my own life, you know, so I'm teaching them basketball skills, yes, but giving them life skills as well through the game of basketball. So I think that's so important because, you know, that's what I do with my life. Right. And how important is them to be a part of this sort of basketball academy? Because these things didn't really exist when I went to high school in like the early 90s. We would just, there would be summer basketball camps, yeah. but that would be it. The, the only way you hone your skills is you join your high school team and then you try to get better and try to make it in the starting lineup. Why is it important to have things like an academy now for the development of these people? I think it's so important, man. It's like, you know, again, like we grew, we're about the same age. So back when we were growing up, we didn't have skill development, yeah. uh, coaches, academies like this. Now they have every resource to, to get better. Yeah. Um, I think it's my duty for, to teach these kids, it's not just about basketball, you know? We, we work hard, but this is preparing you for life. So I think, I mean, this is a game changer in today's yeah. environment, the ba basketball environment and the athletic environment. Yeah, and I think we, we see that when we see younger players enter the pro leagues, like the NBA, they're much more game ready than yeah. they were, like, let's say 10, 20 years ago. No, absolutely. Um, let's talk, uh, I want to segue back to what I asked in regards to how you tackled being uh, at a college level as an Asian American as well. Um, many, there are actually a lot of Indonesian American talent out there. And one of them, uh, one of the ways I realized this was you had a showcase event. Can you tell us more about this event? Yes, yeah, so we work with the Ontario Clippers, the uh, Los Angeles Clippers organization. So they came to me and said, you know what, we want to do an Indonesian heritage game. Okay. So I had the freedom and flexibility to just organize what I wanted to do with that event. So through Road Basketball Academy, I have a handful of kids, seven players that's Indonesian heritage, so they have Indonesian blood. So I basically put them up against another academy. Okay. And it, Every, the theme was Indonesia basketball, Indonesia entertainment, Indonesia culture, yeah. and it was, it was so successful, you know, and it was, it was a way for me to showcase these players because I was the first Indonesian American player to ever come back to Indonesia to play right. and represent the national team. So it was a way for me to showcase these players to the basketball world in, in Indonesia. So eventually, I want to get these players, give them the opportunity and educate them that they do have an opportunity to come back and help this country, whether it be in the IBL mm -hmm. or the national team. Okay, so I want to, uh, what caught my attention was seven players of Indonesian American heritage. When I was growing up in North America, I could barely find another Indonesian in the entire school, but let alone in basketball. Where are, like, where is this growth coming from for Indonesian American athletes? And how did you manage to recruit them or how did they manage to join your academy? So, you know, my Road Basketball Academy is for everyone. Mm -hmm. But from me starting that, people all over the country were coming to me saying, hey, you know, because they know my background, they know right. my story. They were like, hey, my son is Indonesian. He's a basketball player. He's playing varsity, which is the highest uh, basketball level in, in, in the States. And the, and the parents know you as like, because they, yes, they grew up right. like, watching basketball. You were played basketball. Right, okay. so that's the relationship, you know, and I, I, have, I built a relationship with the parents as well, because they trust me. Mm. And, you know, I'm also able to skill develop them, not just mentor them. Um, and you know, tell them about the options that they have, you know. So I think just creating that bridge from America to Indonesia for basketball is is something that I didn't intentionally plan, but it's it's here now and I think it's necessary and it's my purpose. And uh, what do you see for the future of Indonesian basketball players knowing that now we do have them and not only are they able to develop their skills here in Indonesia, but they're getting this exposure and they're going up against talent that are arguably some of the best uh, talents in the world of basketball. So what is that like? Oh, it's, it's, I think it's great. You know, for me, it's just, uh, just to uh, make them understand that because a lot of them, they didn't grow up in an Indonesian community. Right. So it's not that they don't identify as Indonesian, they just don't know that they're Indonesian, you know. Um, so I'm just trying to be that bridge and educate them about that because basically it's the same path that I went on. I didn't really know anything about Indonesian basketball. In, well, about the national that. team and accomplishments, yeah. really. So okay. I wish I had me. <laughs> when, I, when I was their age, was but, and I tell them all the time, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm here for, for them. Okay, I also want to uh, go back to how you said, you know, playing at that level, you didn't identify as like, oh, I'm different than the rest, I'm Asian, so going up against uh, other people of other ethnic backgrounds would be detrimental. What do you teach your Indonesian American athletes about that mental state? Because 
I would say that apart from you and then later on Arki Wisnu, yeah. there was a difference when you two played in the pro league here and then played for the national team or even the ASEAN Basketball League where I saw this mental toughness that at that time did not exist with a lot of the players that played for our national team. A lot of times we would play very well locally, but then once you're up against some international competition, there's almost this, you know, a, a quick example, trash talk. Yeah. If our players get trash talk, they immediately like put their head down and then it would affect them, they'd think about it. Whereas you or Arki, I remember, would just come right in and you just either didn't listen or block it out or you could trash talk back and it did not change your game. What do you teach your students about having that type of mental state? Well, you know, for my Indonesian American students in, in the States, it's like, they're also growing up in the same environment I grew up in, okay. you know, not too many Indonesians uh, in their community. So they, they're not aware that they always look at themselves as one of the others, just as, a, as I did as well. And I think that helped me as a player growing up because, you know, obviously whatever pushback that I got as, oh, you know, he's Asian, I'm better than him. I, I didn't really take it, take offense to it, you know, mm -hmm. If anything, it was a chip on my shoulder to be better, but that was never the angle. I just, I felt like I was just short and always the underdog because of my size. Because of physical attributes. Right, it was never because of, uh, you know, my ethnic background. Right? right. So I think my students for sure are going the same route. They view it the same way. And I always just remind them, be proud to be Indonesian, but you're a basketball player. When you step on the court, you know, everyone's the same. So mm. obviously I'm always gonna push the mental aspect of the game. And, you know, that's what I'm doing. And I do believe like racism in sports exists a lot more in other sports, such as football. We hear about stories all the time, but I think basketball, there's less of it. I mean, it does still exist, but there is less of it, especially since uh, there are Asian powerhouses now in basketball. Yeah. I mean, the Philippines or China. So um, let's shift our attention now in regards to some of the challenges that you've faced so far this past year. What are some of the most difficult things that you've had to face since running your own basketball camp? Um, you know, uh, I didn't face too many challenges. I think it's uh, learning the teaching side of it, right? You, you have to, you have to, just you have to take yourself out of the player mode. Okay. You know, and be. How more, do you mean? So you know, as a player, I was when I was playing, my mentality was focus on winning, winning, getting better, getting better, and okay. I wasn't really abs absorbing input from my teammates and things okay. like that you know because i was just hyper focused on that so gotcha. as a as a teacher as a coach you have to you have to be different you have to view it in from a different angle you have to be more patient you have to better your communication um so i think that's the most challenging part for me is just shifting from player to teacher right um let's talk a bit about the accomplishments for indonesian basketball uh, obviously mentioned earlier uh, team the team won gold the men's team won gold in vietnam the women's won gold in cambodia recently in your opinion um what do we have to do to maintain because i remember uh pai eric tohir said uh during one of his speeches it's like after the men's won their gold he's like this is don't think of this as your end goal this is actually just the start and then the women's team followed that up a year later with gold as well. What must we do to maintain our, basically our, our ranking, our level of play, and general just overall quality in order to maintain what we've got right now? For me, we have to develop the grass, at the grassroots level. Okay. You know, We can't always depend on just getting a naturalized player. Yes, is it important? It, it, there's a factor for getting that, and I think that helps. But we have to develop at a gra grassroots level the fundamentals, the skill work, the ball handling. And so, so when they're ready to get on the national team or play pro, they're a different player, a high level player. And I think we need to shift away from looking for like the tall kid. You know, we're Indonesian. Mm. I think we should focus on the skill development okay. part of it. And then if they grow, that's just a bonus, right? But that, that's most important. That's what I'm trying to help out with. And we've seen that happen a lot in the NBA where um, players go through growth spurts. That's why you have big men handling the ball because they actually didn't start out as big men back exactly. when they were kids. So how, how young are we talking here when you're talking grassroots? I would say 11, 12, okay. you know, it, just like in Middle America. School, probably. Middle school, definitely. Just like, in the, uh, it, just like in America, you know, that's the process. We got 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds that I work with that are highly skilled. You know. One thing that we're lacking that I see is the program that leads up to the pros. Like in the NBA, there's the G League and there's also a college program. I don't see that uh, skills and talent being developed at that level. Um, do you think that that's a focus that needs to be uh, as well, like the, the pre-pros? 
Absolutely. Just like in America, you know, America has probably the best, not probably, they have the best uh, college, you know, program, foundation basically. program. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think we need to set that up here in Indonesia as well. You know, we need that, we need that great college uh, program and it's competitive. That's how you develop, you know? So when you're able to go pro, what, you'll be ready. Yeah. Because that's the product, right? Well, at a young age, you develop the product. So it's a good product once they become pro, you know, if they're not, if they they don't have the fundamentals and foundation yet, the product looks sloppy when they're All right. at pro level. So yeah. So going back to your students, then how many of them do you think, in your opinion, would be willing to, if they became good enough, give it a shot and have a career in Indonesia just like you did? Because that would be certainly, you could argue, it's not homegrown talent because they were actually grown elsewhere. But we see this in sports like football all the time, where kids are sent elsewhere to develop, and then and we, in Indonesian football as well, we send them to play in European leagues, and then when they come back, they play for our national team. Do you see that trend happening for your students down the road? I do, I do. You know, they didn't know anything about their opportunities here um, until they met me. So I think all of them are definitely willing to come back, you know, and their parents are excited about the opportunities. Their parents also w w were not aware of it. So right. uh, they're all willing to come back, you know, sure. and I'm, I'm here to guide them, you know, throughout the whole process for sure. And also I would like to have uh, kids with potential here come there to train, you know, send them for two months, three months. And then when they come back, they'll be a different player. So okay. we're, we're creating it that It works bridge. both ways, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. and I think that's, like it doesn't matter how long you've spent time abroad, even from a very young child. I did so. I left when, in Indonesia when I was two. But moving back here, I felt a sense of belonging, even yep. though I didn't grow up here. And I think that that can be something that can be an asset as well to our country. And as you know, you've been here a week now, back a week. About it's, that? It's been going so fast. How many selfies have you taken? <laughs> Too many to count. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we know that Indonesians uh, do love you in this country. What message do you have for them in regards to, um, you know, what your thoughts are in regards to Indonesia and how it's developed in Indonesia so far? Oh, I mean, the, the welcome back has been just heartwarming for me. Mm -hmm. It's been, it's, it's filled my heart. Um, for, for me, I just want to let everyone know that I'm always going to be able to help Indonesia. My heart is always with Indonesia, and I, you know, I'm creating that bridge for for the basketball side of uh, Indonesia development. Mm -hmm. So, look to have that? maybe the next Indonesia yeah. NBA player. Yeah, there you go. Amen to that. Future. By the way, real quick, you're going to also be back for the FIBA World Cup. Any predictions? Oh, Spain's number one in the world. Can't mm -hmm. count them out. All right. But they're, well, in the same group as Canada, though. Oh, Canada, so that's got, right. Canada. Uh, Shout I've out to Canada. i got my money on Canada, so we'll, uh, we'll catch some of the games together, hopefully. All right, before we go, I'm going to have a couple of uh, challenges for you. The first is, um, it's basically like what's on your mind on my talk show. It's going to be, I'm going to give you two options, and you can't think too long. I want you to just answer Ooh. right away. Just pick one, all right? Ready? First one. Aspak or CLS? Aspak. Aspak. Oh, interesting. They brought me here. No, that's true. So that was your first team that you played for in Indonesia. How many years did you play? Seven. Seven. Yeah. Uh, those. How many championships? Two. Two. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> I see. Pretty good numbers. All right. Next. Two thousand Lakers or ninety-seven Bulls. Ninety-seven Bulls. Really? I'm surprised because you're a West Coast guy. I am. I am. But the goat. Okay. MJ. Oh, really? Can't go would... against that. Can't, can't go against. Uh, and in seven-game series, Bulls Ooh. in. Bulls in six. Michael's never been to a game seven. I'm just saying. Ah, okay. Well, at least, all right. Shaq and Kobe got six games. All right. <laughs> Last one. This one might be the most difficult one. Um, Captain Arki or Dodo? We're talking about Arki Wisnu or Christian Dodo Step. Oh, Captain uh, Arki. Arki. Yeah. How come? How close well, are you? We, we, we're very close. Okay. Me and Arki, that's my little bro. But Dodo, Dodo too. But, you know, I think me and Arki definitely have a different kind of connection since our, our background is similar. Very Correct. Similar, so, yeah. He's an East Coast guy, right? Grew yeah, East Coast New guy, York. New York. Shout out to Dodo and Arky, yeah. my little brothers. Both of them still very much a part of Indonesian basketball as yeah, well, right? And I love it. I'm All so right. proud of them. So we have uh, one more, one more challenge oh, for oh. you. This one is going to be a trickier challenge. Trickier, trickier than more people know, but for this one, we're going to have to move. So uh -oh. let's get over on uh, this uh -oh. side. We've got a free throw challenge. So Ooh. this is the marker right here, this right tape. Here? Okay. Now, this is not as easy as it looks, by the way, because it's uh, not a, 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 oh, actually, let's put it here so we can see. How about here? Okay. Yes? And we'll use that as your marker here. One more step back. There you go. Well, it got further. Hold it on. got a little bit further. <laughs> this is going to be a regulation free throw. So this is, you're going to have three shots. I want to see how many you make. Okay. Yeah, ready? You need no warm up or anything, right. by the way. 
Oh, okay. Ooh, it's tough. It is harder than it Are you trying to use the backboard? <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> okay, like, here we go. Hey, let's go. You got one. All right. Let's go. All right, let's see if you can get two out of three. All right, let's get it. Let's Yay! Congratulations. Thanks, Thank you so much Thank for coming you. by. Thank it's great you. catching up with you. As always, that was our conversation with Indonesian basketball legend Mario Wusang. We have to take another short break, but when we return, we have some updates for you in case you missed our earlier news stories. So to stay with us, we'll be right back with more on the Sea Morning Show. Yeah, I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> I know it's, it's harder than it looks.